Last time I was here, I was wearing these tap shoes, which don't worry, I'm not going to put them on. I'll put them safely over here. Um, but I was wearing these tap shoes, and you know, I'm not sure if any of you had the sincere misfortune of watching me attempt to tap dance, but just in case there is one, I did want to start off with an apology, uh, with a, you know, a disclaimer of sorts. So if you or a loved one saw the 2018 Michigan Musical Theater production of Me and My Girl and were adversely affected by the missed choreography from male ensemble number five, um, <laughs> you are almost certainly legally entitled to compensation, so come see me after the show. Um, though, I gotta say, I nailed the parasol sequences, so it wasn't all bad. Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> I was a member of the 2019 Michigan Musical Theater class, Go Blue. Um, yeah, the <laughs> musical theater in the house. Um, and it was actually on this stage that I realized what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I had the realization right about here, thank you. Um, that is me with these tap shoes. So I had the realization right about here that I cared far more about the lack of marketing outside the power center and the swaths of empty seats than I did about it being year three of my musical theater education and I couldn't tap dance to save my life. Um, I wanted to be a producer. Um, I realized that what I cared about more than anything in the world was storytelling. Taking a lesson, a feeling, an emotion and turning it into a story to be shared. But I didn't want to be a peer. Frankly, I feel a whole lot more comfortable sitting where you're sitting, watching people far more artistically qualified than myself share their incredible gifts, like all of the other amazing speakers we'll hear from tonight. Um, as a producer, it's my privilege and responsibility to work with storytellers to help them bring the best, fullest version of their work to the widest audience possible. And lucky for those storytellers, frankly, all throughout history, in every major civilization, from the women in Japan in the 17th century who developed kabuki, to the Grecian playwrights, to, you know, George Clooney, storytelling, frankly, has been a pretty good gig, right? I mean, all throughout history, storytellers have been lauded, relied upon, even, for their work holding a mirror up to society, and, you know, improving the lives of its citizens, shining a light on injustice. When a society is healthy, we celebrate our artists. When a society is not healthy, we're terrified of those artists. We don't like looking in that mirror. Today, for a number of reasons, we stand at an impasse where suddenly storytelling is derided by wide swaths of American society, even looked on as useless. So in the top of 2020, when everything started to crumble, I looked around with my theater degree, and I suddenly realized that I had studied the number one least employable college major as deemed by seemingly everybody, by USA Today, by CNBC, Insider.com, really, really everybody, but perhaps most embarrassingly, BuzzFeed. <laughs> right? Because at the end of the day, if BuzzFeed is writing your epitaph, you are deeply and profoundly screwed. <laughs> you know, and, and here we are today, here we are today, still amidst the backdrop of the global health crisis, still, you know, looking at every day's headline, seemingly worse than the last, everything terrible. But what did we turn to from day one en masse? We turned to fiction and storytelling, for better or for worse. From day one, the ratings of Dr. Fauci's daily briefings didn't hold a candle to the ratings of everything from Tiger King and Succession to White Lotus and Euphoria. And that's not a coincidence, right? Nor is it new, nor is it wrong. Storytelling and fiction is a necessity. It's our comfort. In fact, amidst every crisis in human history, we've turned to storytelling and fiction first. If you don't believe me, one of my favorite examples. A hundred years ago, 1917, when the First World War was at its most grisly, the top story, the top story for quite some time wasn't about trench warfare, wasn't about the Eastern Front. It was this story. Two young British girls astonished the world with photographs of real fairies. This story, this story ran amid some of the highest death tolls in human history, and people absolutely ate it up. 
Finally, proof of elementals, newspapers exclaimed. Even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, who put deductive reasoning on the map, swore to their legitimacy. People were taking day trips in between carpet bombings and blackout warnings to see these fairies. So I figured, let's, let's take a look. Take a look at the picture that definitively proved fairies exist. <laughs> and now, and I don't want to burst anyone's bubble here, but this is a fake. <laughs> this is a fake. There are strings visible. It's a cardboard cutout, right? And not even a particularly good one. How could people believe this? Because we had to. Because we had to, right? Every day, family members were coming home disfigured or not at all. People had to escape to the world of fiction to avoid the harsh reality of war and famine outside their window. So in a way, these fairies healed us in a way that we didn't truly understand or really appreciate at the time. So actually, thank you, fairies. My friends like to say that I make a living off of my defense mechanism, um, which I don't appreciate. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, my attempt to make sense of the world is to help people fictionalize it, to find the fairies, to make it funny, not violent, to make it make a little more sense, which I think is what we all need, or it's certainly what I need. I remember after the pandemic, I you know, loaded my house plants into a car, Drove back to live with my family for a couple months, lost my job. Um, and I remember every night being so scared in my room, just terrified of the next shoe to drop, the next disaster to come. And the only thing that comforted me wasn't, wasn't the daily briefings, it wasn't the updates, it was a series of solo magic shows that I found on Netflix and must have streamed 40 hours a week in lieu of my non-existent job. I mean, today, more than any other time I can remember, people are desperate to return to the world of fiction, which means we also need to remember our responsibility as storytellers. Frankly, I'm surprised that uh, people haven't tried to blame those British fairies for some of these, um, though I'm sure some would like to. Fairies in the capital, fairies in the ballot box, fairies really wherever we need them to be. Fiction is what we crave, but when fed to us by those with their own agenda, it can turn into our biggest downfall. From Watergate to the steps of the Capitol, this is what happens when we stop teaching storytelling as an art form and instead start blurring the lines of what's actually materially real. I've been lucky enough over the past couple years to be a part of some really incredible pieces of art that we're so proud of, that we feel add to the conversation from Jeremy O'Harris's incredible new play, Slave Play, which rips open American history at the intersection of race, gender, sex, and sexuality, to David Byrne's American Utopia, which uses song and poetry to express his, frankly, inspiring and relentless optimism for this country to truly change and achieve the ideals that it set out and spoke but never lived up to in action, to Douglas Carter Bean's Fairy Cakes, which used those classic fairies to tell a story of love, family, class, and what we owe each other when things go wrong. A question that we so often get is, what kind of art do you want to be a part of? What kind of stories do you want to be a part of? And I'm starting to think that the answer is actually just another question. What kind of stories do people need to see right now? Storytelling is absolutely vital to how we perceive the world and see those around us. It can make us feel compassionate, angry, giddy, excited, in love, or terrified. And that's a massive, massive responsibility. Through storytelling, every single one of us has the power to change someone else's world. And it's not only our privilege, but our highest obligation to do so for the better, however and whenever we can. At the end of the day, no matter who you are, what field you're in, you're a storyteller. Storytellers are environmentalists, engineers, data scientists, and construction workers. At the end of the day, you're telling a story. You're taking what you know to be true, know to be right, and sharing it with someone, illuminating them to help them along their way. Storytelling is our only unlimited renewable resource, and it costs us nothing to give away. You know, my favorite version of storytelling, not those, my favorite version of storytelling might happen on a stage, 
but yours might not. It might happen in a lab or in a classroom or across the dinner table, but it doesn't matter. It's all equally as important. If we're going to truly learn to understand and talk to each other, then we have to get a whole lot better at telling and listening to stories. And after the overwhelming demand on fiction over the past year, I'm starting to think that maybe I might have chosen the right field, you know, regardless of what BuzzFeed or the Michigan Daily's review of my tap dancing might say. <laughs> it was negative, surprise. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and now working with the largest media company in the world, we have the opportunity to tell stories to a lot of people, to heal people, to give them just a momentary reprieve from the anxious and terrifying world around us. We can all do that. We can all do that through how we tell our stories to others. So as we walk out of here today, I'd just like to, I'd like us to remember a couple of the cardinal rules of the theater, and I think we'll all be okay. Look out for your scene partner. Remember who you are and who you're talking to. And don't step on the punchline. Thank you. <laughs>